Good evening, folks. How you all doing? Hope this is coming through loud and clear. Let's see who's hanging around tonight. Can already see that Darius and Big Number 13 are in. Arsus and Jace and Infinisil and our Primus and Skinny Seahorse. Welcome. Tonight. Loud and clear. Excellent. Boom. Let's do some things. Right. What are we doing tonight? We are going to start with some doodling. We're going to do another prototype for something I'm wanting to do in Tailspire, which is the game I'm working on in my Dojube. Um... I should probably bring up a picture to show the issue. Yeah, let's have a look. Let's just uh, bring up the Tailspire Alpha GitHub stuff because they'll have filed some issues there. And we can have a look at one of the pictures. Now, what would be the best one? Let's just look for narrow or let's just see if we get any pictures in these. Okay, actually, this is a perfect example of a condition that we're getting into. So, people build these um, boards using our tiles. And sometimes they build some uh, very tight corridors. Now, here the actual issue is we have a dude floating here. But ignoring that, this is a pretty tight corridor down here. And what that means is people do stuff like we're seeing this camera view right now. They twist everything around so they can move their piece easily up and down. That kind of sucks. Um, because there's probably a more comfortable angle to be surveying the scene. But what it means is we're going to need to chop away bits of these tiles to be able to see what's going on behind. You could use like an outline, or you could kind of make the wall partially transparent, and we might do the transparency thing. Um, but it would be really cool to actually just remove chunks of the wall and let you interact with your um, character directly, or combine a few effects, you know? So we're going to look into some cutaway stuff. Now it's really an extension of something we did before. Like way back we did this cutaway shader. Um, that had this ripply effect and all this kind of stuff. It's going to start like a very simple version of that. Um, we're going to discard fragments. And we're going to draw back faces. And then hopefully we're going to do um, what amounts to an uh, optical illusion. To try and fill in some of the gaps. <coughs> oh, sorry about that. So, let's assume... Let's assume I already had been thinking about the math. Uh, let's assume we have some corridor, like this. Or we can even assume this is one piece. We do have a piece like this currently, but it sucks. Um, and we're going to chop away one of the walls. So we're going to use the shader to chop down this wall. Now, normally we don't draw back faces, so we're going to be we're going to draw and we're going to see this side, um, and then we'll be able to see the floor because this bit will be a back face. And that's a little bit ugly. What I want is a kind of three D effect rather than a two D cut. Hey, Aka Graham, um, thanks, Jace as well, and Darius for for uh, let me know about the video and audio, which is grand. Um, so what we're going to do is, just like last time, we're going to draw the back faces. We're going to draw the object a second time, but only drawing the back faces. Um, now, if we just textured the inside of this the same, let's say we had a, like a brick wall texture here on the outside, we could texture the inside with this as well. But all that's going to do is make the object look hollow. But if our eye is up here somewhere, our great big kind of eye of sour anything looking down on the world, um, what if we were to texture this with whatever the texture would have been for this point? So we take the origin here and the destination here. We draw a line between them and we work out what the UV would be at this point on this surface here. And if we did, what should happen is we could texture that. We can texture the back faces in a way that it looks like it's a surface here as long as we don't do any shadows and stuff like this um, in fact actually we could make it work with a shadow pass as well but that would just mean passing like taking this stuff into account somewhere else um, yeah so we could do a normal texture normal maps all those kind of things on that top surface so all I want to do which should be relatively simple I hope um, is to calculate this position and then turn it into world space UVs and maybe we have something um, Shin says, have you looked into how games like The Sims do this stuff? No, but I thought they had a 2D cutaway. Or maybe they do have a 3D cutaway. We did look at one point into actually making segments of the walls. Um, 
yeah, um, so they could be removed. We were uh, using it for another reason, but it just didn't feel good. So I'd um, like to do a more dynamic cut like this. We shall see what happens. So anyway, I think the rough process... Actually, let's just, let's just get the first bit set up. Let's get the cutaway going on down here. So... There's a ball, but it's a bit small. Let's make a bigger one, and we can start playing with that. So I'm going to make a new object. Um, we are in episode 63 um, of the Play With Verts pile of shitty sauce that we've been using, kind of, so we can get going quickly. Um, yes, and what was Shin saying here? He says, um, probably don't want the cutaway shadows in the shadow map anyway. Indeed. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure... Yeah, we don't we don't need the cutaway to be respected in the um, yeah in the shadow map. That's definitely correct. Um, we might want if there was an uh, object. Um, where is it? If we had our cutaway wall here, for example, and we had an object here that wasn't being cut away, then we might want its shadows to cast down onto this surface, and that would be interesting. So, but then we'll be just doing a variant of the same technique, so that should be okay. And uh, for shading, you'd also have to get the normals and whatever you have right as well, though. Yeah, for sure. Well, the um, the nice bit is with the cutaway, is going to be 100% flat. So our normal is always going to be directly up. Um, if that's what you're talking about, and if it wasn't, then probably don't have to... I, I, yeah, I'll probably be ignoring it. Um... Yes, the cutaway should obviously be in effect. Yeah, we'll be we'll be highlighting that for sure. All right, so hi. By the way, I didn't didn't say hi to you. Not that you're gonna mind. Right, let's have a look. Let's um, we're gonna do a ball just because I don't have any other tiles imported in the scene. I really should get some of the, the tiles exported so we can use them in our scene. Uh, but it also means I wouldn't be able to share them right now. So uh, I'm just gonna use a ball today. Um, let's just call it tile, tile, what am I doing, ball, tile, there we go, bam, bam, oh that was the only bit, okay, groovy, okay, so now we should be able to make one of those, and I'm going to set the default radius to be like 6 or something, and then we're going to make a tile and see what happens. It complains because I didn't do what I'm meant to do. That's fine. Um, oh, yeah, I'm going to give it a position. So let's just go and see in Play With Verts where the other one was placed. Um, ball. 0, 10, 20. So we'll just do 0, 10. 0, 10, 0. There we go. That's the guy we're going to be playing with. And so to start with, we'll just make a new copy of the basic shaders um, so we can start doing the fragment discard and things like this. So let's go to render. And I'm actually going to bring up things here so we can go and look how the rendering is normally done. Um, draw. Oh, there's still a few bits left over from last week. I'm going to get rid of that. And creature ID can go away as well. Boo! What are you going on about? Um, continue. That's fine. Right, so let's go and look again at draw. We're going to copy this. We're going to take it down to our tile piece. And we're just going to shove it here because we're going to change some things soon. Bam. Change the thing here to be tile. Okay, so if I just bring up the REPL and make sure everything's still alive before I go barreling ahead, do a clear. Go in here, go print high, but spot correctly. Then we can see high print lots of times. We are definitely rolling there. It's great. Gonna drink some diesel fuel so I can keep going. Ah. Since the cutaway should obviously be obviously effect, so casting shadows onto it should also be a no-no. Yeah, you might be right, to be honest. Yeah, you're probably right. 
I just want to make sure it doesn't suddenly feel like there's extra bright spots there because we're going to texture it with like some gray plasticky texture or something like this in game. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, something like that. We have to make sure it doesn't like light up too much because we'll be having an extra effect on there to show that it's a cutaway as well, like a rim um, effect or something like this. I leave that stuff up to uh, my mate Johnny because he's much better at the graphical stuffs. Okay, bug number 13 saying, ah, oh, I love Lisp's ability to do native REPL debug. Yeah, man, just stuff. Be, being able to code and not have to wait is nice. It's really good. So, okay, let's go and this is the thing pipeline. So we're going to go and copy that. Um, let's just copy everything down here. Thing vert stage, we'll copy this. It might need, mean, it might be that we don't need to copy any of this, right? We can just use the shaders we've already got, but for now, copying it is a good place to start. Um, and we're going to change this. So this is now going to be the tile vert stage. And we'll have a tile frag stage. And we'll have a tile pipeline. Tile vert stage. So, don't know why I just overwrote that tile frag stage and recompile, and we are good. So, now we should be able to change this to be tile pipeline. And again, it's not obvious that anything's actually happened because things are working. So, all I'm going to do is just come to the end of the fragment shader and do this. So, we can see that yes, we're actually still running and we're making changes and they're all live and all that kind of stuff. So, that's good. So, what I think think the effect is going... Actually, should we do the cutaway or should we talk about the effect first? Let's do the cutaway. What we are going to need to do is to know the world coordinates for every fragment because we want to disc discard them based on their height. Um, for this experiment, we're just going to do a plane. Um, later on, we'll be doing a shaped, like a volume cutaway. Um, but it's going the, the volume that we're cutting away is going to be described by a mathematical function. So for now, just doing this with... Um, what am I saying? Doing this with... Just a, a height will be fine. Um, also, unrelated to anything, Chimera has put a calendar out. Um, you should get this because it's really nice. It's really well made and got some lovely artwork in it. Do it. I'm not going to show you what's inside because it's kind of the point. Um, but yes. Good thing to get. Um, let's have a look. I'm sure someone in the chat will throw a link there as well. And if they do, I'll make sure to link it in the YouTube video afterwards. All right, saying... Okay, Chimera saying, by the way, an alternate solution to this problem would be to render the object on top of the walls and do the shader apply. Yeah, I, I'm, a re I'm really not a fan of checkerboard shader kind of stuff. Um, I saw a lovely implementation of one, and we may go that way, but there's something about it that just makes me... I, I think it's because I've seen it overused in a bunch of games it just makes me grumble also this seems like a good problem for using a tessellation geometry shaders maybe totally yeah i mean what you could do is we could subdivide the geometry of this pretty heavily and then we could push the geometry down and update the uvs and things like this so we actually get the um yes yeah, so we would actually have mesh there but this is such a cheap effect like it just costs us an extra pass like an extra version of the um like drawing the back faces could be pretty good um, but yeah, we'll see. All right, so let's have a look. What do we pass over from our vert stage to our fragment stage? Do, do, do. Oh, right, all this has been factored out into a common function. Okay, that's um, not helping us at this moment. So let's have a look. Oh, okay, we... Well, this is actually great. So we already pass over... I mean, this goes to GL. The, the first result of the uh, vertex shader um, is just handed off to GL as the, the vertex position. Um, then we've got a world normal. We've got a world position, which is exactly what we're after. And then some updated UVs and things like this, which we don't care about. But this, we definitely do. So we actually don't need our tile vert stage right now. That adds us nothing. Um, so here we can change this back to a thing vert stage. And... Then we can use that this must be the world position, which is really cool. So then, what if we just did... I don't know. Like, we could do a cond here, surely. 
let's just do cons um, position I don't know y of cos is greater than where do we place this guy it was at like 20 or something yeah let's, let's just start with 15 and we'll start fucking around with this value um, if we do this then we're just going to discard um, and I think let's see this is we'll see what Kef, uh, what Avario the compiler thinks of this very soon um, what are we going to do here let's push this around there let's get rid of that and let's wrap this in a few little clauses and that's our cond there okay so it's happy with that oh and already excellent we can see that we've got a, a bit chopped off there if we reduce this number to 12, we can see we've chopped off more of the object. But of course, we're not seeing any of the back faces because back faces are culled. So we're going to draw the object again, this time um, culling the front faces and keeping the back faces. The reason we don't just disable the culling is we want to use a different shader from the back than for the front. So how are we going to do that? Let's go to play with verts. Oops. Go to the same starting name file. Let's have a look. Da, 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 da. Where do we draw stuff? Am I being that dumb? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Um, here's our loop where we draw all the things. So we have our. This is um, the function that's called each frame. Um, and then we loop through all the things. And for each thing, we update them and we draw them. Now, what we'd probably do, yeah, all I'm, I'm, all I'm gonna do in this case is we're gonna go um, when the type of the thing is, and this is not, again, a good quick way of doing things, but it'll work for us. Um, then we're gonna draw it again um, with a different approach. So, doom, right. And of course, type is not a function, it's type P for checking that, and we'll say continue. Uh, type is still undefined, I'm using the wrong continue. This is retry rather than, I wish that was renamed. Uh, but so we'll click four instead to just actually continue. Um, hmm, can you tessellate and cover the top surface? That way you only need one pass. You could definitely tessellate. You could actually. What, you, what, you, what I think I'd do is I'd tessellate everything above the point we're chopping, um, just a, a certain density, and then I'd flatten it out across the the top. It could get a bit, it's a bit complex actually when the geometry is more interesting. I don't know exactly how I'd do that. We could just clamp the Y down of everything above. You just say the Y is the top position. Um, that could work, but you still want to update the UVs for those things, which you could do as well. Because if you're doing the flattening, then you've already got that conditional on there, so it's not costing you any more, probably. It's an idea for sure. We could definitely check it out. Um, let's have a look. Draw top. Draw fake top. Freak. Fake top. There we go. And we are then going to put this here. Not doom. Draw fake top. Um, we're going to use the current camera, of course. And we're going to use thing. So in the actual game, we'll be keeping track of what things need to have the cutaway and we'll be handling those in a special case, which means we won't be doing like two passes on every object in the scene because there's fucking thousands and thousands of them. Um, but, okay, that it's fine, but of course we're not seeing any change because we haven't stopped it um, culling back faces. Um, so what we'll do is we'll do with set F. Um, do we have... Do I always forget to have... Oh no, what I haven't done. This is actually really uh, stupid. I didn't realize... How's the best way to do this? I've been... I wrote that little function, um, slime enable concurrent hints, 
um, to yeah to to allow me to have the um, the suggestions down here in the mini buffer. I can't remember what they're called right now. Um, but I was forgetting that there is a thing that Slime supports. If you create a .swank file, um, or .swank RC, I can't quite remember, in your home directory, then that will be run when um, Swank starts up, so on the common Lisp side. So then you can set those flags um, yourself as well. So that's really good. Is it, wait a second, is that right, quite right around? I can't remember if it's on the common Lisp side or the... Anyway, there's a way to do this without uh, writing an extra function that's totally supported, and I just didn't know about it. I'll show, I'll probably do a video on that another day, actually, because that could be quite useful, just as like a really short one, like a two minute video. Um, okay, so with setf, what are we gonna do? Right, I need to get the REPL up because I don't actually know what I'm looking for right now. It is probably something like cull face. Um, yeah, okay, so yeah, cull face is currently set to back. So if we grab that and we say with set f and we change it to front and we wrap this in it, then we get the inside rendering there. So that is the inside of the thing. But we want to render that in a different way because as you can see, what we're getting is just like a bowl. We're getting the inside of that object. Um, and one of the shadows are obviously wrong given that it's the inside of a bowl, but forgetting that. Um, yes, so we don't want to do this. We want to fake it so it looks like it's a flat top object. Now there's a number of restrictions in Tailspire that just make this feasible. Um, and that is, because we're doing that kind of top-down view, we're always looking from this upper vantage point. Things that are on floors above us we actually hide, uh, big just for ease of navigation. Um, all of our objects are um, how do you how do you put it? They're like sealed containers. There's no one-sided faces or anything like this on it. Um, they're always like there's a there's a nice term in the mathematical papers they use for these kind of closed geometries, and I can't remember what they are. Um, they're watertight anyway. Um, so there's a few things here. A lot of our objects are kind of it's fairly generally simple geometries and things like this. Um, Chimera is giving more advice on other ways to do this as well. Um, Chimera is saying actually tessellate a ring at the desired height and flatten all the verts with that above height to the desired height. Yeah, totally. Um, hey, Marianne. Um I pushed um, at the beginning of this stream, and for me, I was able to just start it. Um, so hopefully that will work for you as well. I know that you're one of the ones who definitely likes to follow along. Um, so hopefully that works. If not, hit me up, because I think this effect is going to be pretty quick. So we have some time to faff around. Um, yeah, Shin, I think you're right when it comes to the flattening things. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I'm not sure what works out cheap because then we're adding tessellation pass and like it would be in, it'd be difficult to because if we have lots of small triangles in the upper part, portion of the object, then maybe we don't need to tessellate them too much anyway. And yeah. Yeah, the only thing I'm thinking is like we can we can bring the um vertices straight down if we have an object like like this, and we're chopping it off here. We can just bring these down. Um, but when you've got an object like like this, say, and we're chopping it off here, we can't bring these ones straight down. Uh, anything with an overhang. So we want to bring those back to... Yeah, there's some, there's some cases there which I'm not entirely sure how we handle with um, just tessellating and bringing the things down. Also, if there's fine geometry above, we probably don't need to tessellate it as much as things that aren't already as fine. Um, so yeah. But it could be, yeah, getting it down to a single pass might be worth it, but we'll, we'll have to have a play. Um, well now, get rid of that. And yes, now we did set up so we can start drawing the back faces in a different way. Um, and for now, all we're gonna do is make them black. So this whole thing, this will be black or some fixed color anyway. So. 
Dum -dum 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 -dum. Now I come to th think about it. Oh no, we do need, yes, we do need this to be special cased because we do the discard. That's very important. And now we need another pipeline. Um, which I think we can just copy paste this. It's tile um, fake top pipeline. Um, and we go tile fake top frag stage. Oh yeah, this is what we need. Really long names and really low screen resolution. Because that is a wonderful combination. A winning combination for streaming. Okay, so everything's still live. Woo. Um, go into things. We'll go down to the fake top. We're going to take this tile fake top pipeline thing and shove it here. And then we're going to replace this final color thing with one zero 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 zero. So it'll be red. So now the inside looks red, but it does look kind of like this is a capped top. Now, of course, we have no texture and all that kind of stuff, but because of that lack of um of depth there um yeah that already kind of gives the impression that there's a lid on this thing one second one just get my so thank you all right Ugh. okay so what we want to do instead now is we want to put the put a texture on top um so it looks yeah looks like it's sealed now what should we use for that, actually? Have we got some textures? We, we do have some textures in here. So JPG. Um, brick wall, brick wall normal. What's the difference? There's that one. And there's... Oh, uh, normal. <laughs> normal is the normal, you muppet. Not, it's not like a regular wall. Um, yeah, scratch to be cool. We'll use that. Um, let's have a look. Oh, where do I want to do this? Let's just have a look. Let's get the REPL first, and let's just get this loaded in. Um, I can't remember what we called it. It's been so long since we've done any of this stuff. Load text or get text? Yeah, there we go. Get text, does that just work? Yeah, it does, nice. And we're just going to be really lazy with this stuff. We are going to um, go to, we'll start with things. We're just going to make a variable here somewhere to store it. Actually, let's go down and put it with tile. Def uh, fake top texture is nil. Um, and then we're going to go to play with verts again. And when we set everything up, We are going to go um, set a fake top texture to be that. It's not. It's not really correct, though, is it? Um, it's the fake top sampler. But whatever. That's correct. Done. Right. So now we have a sampler. Um, that's the texture we're going to use for the top of this. So now we need to work out that position. Now, we, you can use a nice generic kind of ray surface intersection, uh, but we've actually got some really simple cases, so it's probably not necessary. Um, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna look up something right now. I just wanna try things. Um, Shara says, curse you concave geometry. Totally, man. <laughs> it gets really fucky, doesn't it? Um, Anyway, if your current approach just quirks normals are back faces to up, 100% agree. We will do that. For sure. Um, all right, so we have an object like this. This will be the front faces. This will be the back faces. We'll have our eye up here looking down, our camera. That's godly position. Um, and then we are going to, if we draw a line, a terrible, oh, that's actually not the worst line for me. We've seen far worse lines on this stream. Down to here, 
and this is our chop away point here. So we've chopped off the top of the object, just like here. Um, we know this position, and we know this position. We need to know... Ah, fucking idiot. Right. <laughs> we need to know this position here. So I think we, if what we do is we, we just take this vector and we say that it's, and um, we take the vector and we divide it by, um, let's have a look. This surface is always a fixed height. So what we can do is we can get this change in height here. So we'll just call this X and this vector here we'll call v so if we take v and divide it by x and then multiply it um, by this height here then we'll have scaled this uh, vector down to just point at this point and then we can just add it to this so if this is z then we just do x times z and then we just give this a name. Let's of course call this point A. So then it's A plus this should be our position here. Is that not completely insane? I, th I think that's, it's dirt simple, but it should be all right. Um, if it does work, then that's grand. And we we're doing everything in world space coordinates, so it's pretty easy. Um, again, if we're doing this in, when we're doing this for real, like levels could be very large depending on floating point error and things like this we might want to i mean we'll be re-centering the level after you move so far anyway to handle like massive multi-kilometer boards one day um right now we don't need to do that i think this will be all right other the other thing we could do is just change all this into camera space or like clip space coordinates and we do it there it'll be the same math so that should be fine um Let's have a look. Now, do I want to remove all this stuff? Yes, for now I do. I can always copy paste it back in later. So, do 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 do. What an idiot! That is not the function. That was. There we go. Ooh. What? Oh, fuck. Of course. I didn't have the cutaway in it anymore, and suddenly it's the full sphere again. Okay, so let's get rid of all of this, and let's... <laughs> that caught me out for a second. Zero, 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 zero. Okay, so now we have our flat top or black topped thing there. Do this. Right. And so if we're not discarding, then let's do some path. Do we know the camera position? Because we really need to know that. Um, Something must know it. Maybe it's just not passed in yet. That actually is very feasible. Okay, let's just do this. Um, cam pass world. Back three. Um, okay, cam pass world. Let's go to where this is being called. I'll do this over here. Do, do, do. Fake, 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 fake. There we go. Cam, pass, world. And we want to pass in the camera. So let's just look at the current camera position and make sure it is actually three components, which it is. Hurrah! Then we can just go boss of camera, and that should be working. Great. 
So now we have the information in here. So we need to know this X first. So why if um, is equal to um, the well, we're going to be doing a subtraction. The camera is always going to be higher, so let's start with that. So we'll do y of campos world minus y of our position that we're talking about, our little fragment position down here or in here somewhere. Um, once we've got that, we're going to create this vector. So the um, yeah, so the I don't know full ray. I don't know what I'm doing. Then we just subtract. Um, which way around is it? So yeah, this one minus this one again. So we can do. We, yeah, we do plus minus campus world. Um, that should be all right. Maybe we'll see. Um, call out if you think that one's wrong. It's easy for us to switch as well, so that's not a problem. So then we've got a full ray, and then we decided that we need to. Um, divide that ray um, so scaled ray should be the full ray divided by y diff um, and then multiplied by something we haven't done yet which is y to cut away or something like this y to cut away which is going to be um, our cutaway height, which we will be needing to pass in at some point. So let's just call that cutaway height, call it 12. Um, remove 12 from here, make it cutaway height. That was really dumb, Chris. It's not written yet, so you can't just do that. Go away. I know it's broken. It was broken by a fool. Um, let's have a look. Why to cut away is... Come on, man. This height minus this height. Yeah. Okay. So And then we've got Y to cut away, and that's the scale ray. And then we just add that onto the original camera position. So So our top pos is going to be the cam pos world plus our scale ray. Which is kind of cool. Right. So now what could we do to visualize that? Well, it's a three component vector. So we could just use it as a color. Um, let's take it. Let's take Topos here. <laughs> that looks dope. That is so nice. because there, We've got... Um, obviously, this saturates incredibly quickly in any given direction. Um, but what's really nice here is we can see, at least from these lines that this seems to be obeying the kind of perspective lines we have down here from the tiles. That looks all right to me. And so now we can use this for world space texturing, which is, oh, we, we are actually getting pretty close already. So what I recommend you do is if you have, especially to people who are newer to this stream, if you have any Keppel, Vario, Lispy, whatever questions, feel free to pile them on because this might be a slightly fast stream um, otherwise. And we'll just go and do other stuff. We'll tinker around with some things. We'll fuck about. That's fine. Um, because one of the things we won't be able to do is... Um, we haven't thought about yet is walls. Because I don't want to just cut away vertically. I want the, the sides as well. Um, but really these are special cases of the technique that we already have. Um, it's a little more complicated because there's... Like we want to do it to the various cardinal planes. But that's fine. Is that really a term? Cardinal planes? Sounds good though. Arsis. Yes, that seemed very easy. It is kind of though, isn't it? It's like... I was thinking about this the other day when just on doing that tile. One thing will be to generate the function that's the... that is the cutaway volume. Rather than just using a height, we'll use a volume. Which will change this very slightly. No, actually it won't. Because we'll, what we'll do is we'll have a, two, a function that describes the 2D shape and then we'll have the height. That way we can use the same math for the height portion and then you just have a um, 2D sine distance kind of field function to describe if you're in the region that is being chopped. 
and that'll be easy. And then we're then what we're going to have to do is split um, because there'll be vertical edges to these things. So just like we have a horizontal edge here, if you've got a large block and you're chopping out the middle, there'll be these vertical sides. Um, but this is going to be the same kind of thing. Work out the projected ray. Um, like, yeah, use the back faces to fill that in. And um, it could be all right. Right, anyway, so let's um, let's get some stuff in. First thing I want to do, actually, is I want to move cutaway height out and make it a uniform. So how are we going to do that? We're going to remove this. We're going to get rid of that. We're going to go here. We're going to go cutaway height. We're going to make it a float. Um, now that fucks up. That's fine. Um, and we're going to take this and we're going to bring it up into the tile pipeline up here as well. We're going to put that there. And we're going to go down and find 12 and we're going to replace it with cutaway height. Good. All that disappears because we're not passing in the right value yet. Uh, we're going to go to things and we'll come down here and this draw and draw fake top. Um, we'll call it it's called cutaway height, so we need to call it that. And we're going to just... Let's have a value that we can easily tweak. Cutaway height. Um, we'll just put this up here for now. Def parameter 12. Um, pass that in. So we can see we get the volume now. Those are the back faces being drawn. And then we pass it into the first shader. Now we've got the front faces being drawn correctly. Um, I'm going to get rid of this math stuff over here. We now should be able to cut away height and play with this. So if we set it to 8, then it chops down lower. If we set it to 15, it chops higher. 12 was just a nice balance, so let's do that. We also are going to want to take our um, that sampler we were looking at earlier. What was it called? The fake top sampler. There it is. The Funk Soul Brother. And fucking love that dude. Anyway, um, we'll pass in fake top sampler and we'll call it fake top sampler. Again, let's go to render. Let's go and add that uniform. This is nice and easy still. Um, Fake top uh, why top sampler which is a yeah sampler 2D come on Chris we're nearly done stop screwing it up and of course now this is too long to be comfortable so I'm gonna have to ugly drop this down um, okay so now what we can do I can compile this so that works now all we need to do is texture this top surface and the way we're just going to do that is we are going to turn these into UVs and the first version of this is just going to be top position we're just going to take the X and Z coordinates and we'll use those as our UVs and then we are going to replace this Let's just comment it out actually we'll go texture Fake top sampler with UV. Pretty good. That looks promising. Let's scale this a bit so it's uh, a little less shitty. That's not the way. <laughs> there we go. That is a pretty solid optical illusion. Now remember that we... We can actually go into this object and it the flat that we don't go through the top surface. So we like can go inside this bowl. And we oh wow, that's really cool. I didn't think about that effect, but that makes a lot of sense. It looks like we're in some kind of some weird old school tunnel. Um And the reason is that we can go inside that shape is this is not the top. Remember, we're still just drawing the back faces of this thing and just pretending. One of the really nice side effects of um, texturing using world space coordinates for these top parts is that if we have two objects right next to each other and they both get chopped away, then the texture will be seamless atop across the two of them, which is going to look really good. This is obviously going to be some plastic texture and all that kind of shit. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's <laughs> that's actually most of what I wanted to do. Um, 
we could bring back this like the normals and things like this so we can do um, lighting and things correctly um, I think we'll do that also questions things in the chats because we have fucking ages that was 45 minutes I mean I know it's a simple effect but we've tried to do simple things before that have taken ages as well so let's um, clean well let's add a bit more just so it kind of fits in with everything else uh, we'll make another object we'll see that their textures are continuous across them just make sure that that's all sensible um, it's kind of good Originally, I thought this was going to be more complicated. It would like have to take into account, like the um, projection and all this kind of shit. But as long as we're doing it world space, it's actually really simple. And if, again, we could port this to clip space, which means the floats are all going to be in the right area. Yeah, it's going to be. It's going to be fine. Uh, Shimera is saying, "All right." So Shimera is currently answering some questions from bug number thirteen. So maybe we should look at those as well. Let's have a look. So how does the texturing of a sphere work? Good question. Um, yes, so... Yes, all of this is made up of triangles, like Shamara was saying. Um, we generate some coordinates on the texture we want to use for each, the corner of each triangle. And um, the GPU will stretch that image over that triangle. Um, is there a good way to show this? We could bring back our old... like our. Um, shaders for visualizing um, wireframe and things like this. Um, but yeah. Okay, Graham saying, could we take a look at the generated GLSL code for the file fake top frag stage? I'm just curious. Of course we can. Let's just take the whole let's take hold the, the whole pipeline because that would be interesting. Okay, in fact, I'm going to print that so we can just mouse across it without it turning it into a presentation. Um, can you do that? I, I'm not actually sure. No, it still presents it. Okay, then we'll do this map print. No, map cut. Uh, map nail print. There we go. Right, so. Um, Yes, this is the fragment stage here. So we're using GL46. Okay, apparently that's supported. Um, this is the definition for our light struct. Um, here's the data being passed in from the vertex stage. We've got... Um, Oh yeah, this is defining the output for this stage. So this is the color we're writing out at the end. Um, and then... Um, we've got the uniforms. So those are the... Right, remember the uniform means that the value is the same across all the iterations of this, um, of this fragment stage. So this fragment stage is run for every single fragment on all the parts of the screen, well, on, on all of this, sorry. Um, but these values will stay the same for all of them, so that's why they're their own thing. We can see here that we've got our P lights. Um, what is this? Is this a UBO? I guess it is. Yes, this is a UBO being passed in here. Um, so it's, it's a slightly different. We've got both the P light definition is this correct? Oh, no, no, actually, that's fine. Never mind me. I'm, uh, I was making something up there. We have, yeah, more uniforms. And then we have, yeah. Let's have a look. We have the result from the if statement. So, of course, in in uh, Lisp, um, our ifs return values, where in C-like languages, they're statements, so they don't. So this is the value that, um, this is the variable the result is going to be put in. Um, we can see that either side of this um, if here, the branches, actually result in different types. This one discards and doesn't return anything, and this one um, returns... Um, this one returns, yeah, this texture thing here. And it's allowed to have different types on either side of the branch because this one is a discard, so it's the end of that program anyway, so that result never gets used. Um, 
Yeah, the Lisp code's cheating slightly because obviously we're providing lots of import mechanisms and things like this. There are some things for that people use for GL um, that do things like this, but again, I, I don't like um, C style includes that whole copying text in just is super janky to me. Um, I prefer, I mean, not to say that my approach isn't janky, janky, but the idea of having something proper that actually handles types and all this stuff and brings them all together is much nicer. Um, yeah, and that's it really. There's a bit of um, there's a bit of jiggery pokery here where we get like we are assigning this value into this variable and then this variable into this value, and we don't need to do that. The reason we don't care about it in Vario is that when you compile your GLSL, it's aggressively optimized, and like any 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 compiler at all worth its salt is going to be doing constant folding. So this really doesn't matter. All of this stuff is going to be constant folded away. Any functions are going to be inlined, all that kind of stuff. It's just not worth thinking about. Vario is a very dumb compiler. It was the first com compilery type thing I wrote. It's been through a few iterations, but all of them are pretty dumb. Um, oh, I've got to talk to you about another compiler as well soon. But let's have a look at whatever. What, what were we doing? I can't remember. It doesn't really matter. But... Yeah, my description of the, the text string was pretty bad as well. Um, I left out a lot of things there. We actually do the. It stretches the coordinates over the triangle, and we use those coordinates to look up th the uh, color in the texture. Um, but yes. Oh, Chimera saying, by the way, Bag is my good chap. Oh, I'm in trouble. We need to talk about an ASD format for GLSL. I want to rewrite GL, um, GLSL TKs, and while I'm doing, oh yeah, GLSL Toolkit. And while I'm at that, would be great if we could make Vario out that too, instead of directly producing GLSL. That's an interesting idea, man. We could. We could. Um, I'll have to have a look. The problem, the, the only problem is, like I say, Vario is super janky, and there's a lot of things in there that are just... Um, yeah. There's a lot of things that are rather messy. I'd like to think that um, that stuff is separate enough that I can do that. Um, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, is there a syntax definition for GLSL? Uh, there's the docs. I mean, it, it's pretty... Uh, yes, th there is There is a GLSL spec. Um, it's not very helpful for getting information out of a lot of the time. A lot of the information you want is spread around. Talk to Shimera um, about what it's like to try and get a definition of um, the, the GLSL stuff. Because he does a lot of parsing of GLSL. There are cases that really... Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's some things to that grammar that are kind of spread around the spec and it bites you later on. Um, we've had a lot of swearing matches about this kind of stuff. <laughs> Chimera says they, they have a uh, partial grammar shit. Yes, that's exactly what they have. Um, I do have um, access to some bits and bobs that might help us there, um, Shin. I have... Can I talk about that? I'm not sure. Hit me up afterwards. We'll talk about some GLSL spec stuff. Um, anyone here going to the European Lisp Symposium this year? Yes! I really I really think I am. I've got to book some flights, actually. It should be happening just before my Kickstarter, so I'm, what, I'm, what I'm hoping to do is use that as like my final decompress before my year gets completely fucked. So that would be great. Fucked in a good way. So some good tail spar typed fuckings. Um, oh yeah, Shin's going to be presenting too. This Saturday, Shin is doing a dry run of the ELS talk. So if you want to go in blind, um, don't go to that. But if you want to hang out and, and just see the first, well, first go. Oh no, was, wait a second. It wasn't the talk this weekend, was it? I'm talking shit. Wasn't it? Was it going through trial? Shin, help me out here. I've forgotten what's happening this Saturday. In the meantime, I'm going to do something maybe I can do, which is sorting out this so in the we want to what's all this malt stuff we can get rid of that as well we haven't used that in a long time that was to do with some light hacking nonsense we had a while ago um this is the normal case we go through and we let's have a look we get the albedo we get the ambient we get the diffuse power yeah Let's try this. Take all of these. Oh, we don't need that last one, actually. 
all of these and let's go shove them down in here in here yes Does that compile? No. Let's see why. We're a fragment stager. Norm symbol norm from map is unidentified. That makes sense. Let's go find out what that was. Norm from map is there. Um, so no. There's a bunch of things here we aren't going to do, I think, right? Ah, um, uh, that's actually interesting. Ah, oh, so we've got okay, we've got a couple of points here. We can just set the normal to straight up, and I'm probably going to do that for now. Um, what we would like to do actually is to have a normal map for this top texture as well, but I don't think I have one for this specifically. We could use the tiles here for like one of these other textures. Sorry, I'm just looking at the shadowing here. Looks wrong, um, but um, yes. Let's just for now. We're just going to go zero one zero. That means we don't need normal or norm from map. We can get rid of this. Get rid of that. Recompile. Okay, so that's happy. Then, so we're going to just have this perfectly flat top surface. Um, then we've got this. All this does is iterate over the lights and it calculates, it calls this calc light function that we wrote ages ago um, and it adds it onto the diffuse power that's affecting this top surface. So that's good. Let's see if we can compile that without anything freaking out. So far, so good. That's great. Um, and then we can go down and we can look at the result stuff here. So this is going to be the like final color stuff. What we need to do is we need to replace this um, texture sampling bit here with look up into our new texture, and that's that. I think we just sorry, I'm explaining that incredibly. Actually, that wasn't even vaguely an explanation. I can't even call it a bad explanation. All right, okay. So all that happened was that got a lot darker, um, but hopefully, what it means is it's actually respecting lighting a bit more. Um, we should try moving it around and see what happens. Um, or moving the lights around for that matter. Let's move it around first. Do, do, do. How do we do that? So let's go back to play with Earths. We are going to draw stuff and we're just going to, each time we are going to, let's get the position of What's the first in things? Is it our tile? Yes, it is. How handy. Right, so we'll just take that as our root position. Cool. Set off the position of um, hmm. how cheeky can we be with this? Um, let's set some things up. Let's create a variable to hold this example tile here. So test tile is nil. That's not how you, oh, and I just did. I just realized I hit a bolt there, which means this has probably stopped working. Oh no, it's still going. I must have hit something else, Never mind. Good, so that's test tile. We'll go down here and we're gonna say, hey, um, set f test tile to be whatever make tile we think. We thing we used before, that's good. Um, let's set f, let's just set things up from the REPL as well. Set f um, test tile to be uh, the first of things. Okay, so we're going to set the position of test tile now to be um, v3 plus.
not 10 not actually we can just set it directly we're just going to set the x component to be the sign of um, whatever now is and then it's vibrating really fast because now is changing very quickly uh, so we're going to times this by 0.001 that slows it down a lot but it's also a very small number so we're going to multiply it by 10 Oh, this is actually fun. Now we're moving it. You can see the the, uh, the effect of us texturing um, using world space coordinates. It's like we're taking a slice. You can see that texture is repeating as this thing moves. So the texture doesn't move when everything else moves, which kind of ruins the illusion, but it's moving. But all of these are going to be static, so that's not going to be a problem. Um, it doesn't seem to be responding to light in the same way that this is, though, which is kind of a bummer. I wonder why that is. Oh, I know why. It's I, I bet it's because our maybe our positions we're feeding into the lighting stuff on our new top positions here. That would be a really logical reason for that to be wrong. Um, so yes, our new position that we calculate top pos. should be what's here. Doesn't seem to make a difference there either. Or at least I'm having trouble seeing it if there is one. That's a bummer. Wonder what that is. Um, everything's inside this let. So all this is being done. We're getting diffuse power. And we're getting something because otherwise it'd be zero. If we just took out this loop, for example. Oh dear, okay. Um, oh yeah, we got a symbol macro let without any contents. Okay. Yes. Okay, so there is some lighting going on there, but it seems a bit off to me. Let's have a look. Um, need a space theme texture. Totally, man. Um, Right, now I can catch up with the chat and I'll find out what it was actually about. Dun 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 dun. Um, Shimera clarified as well with the st referring to the um, the partial uh, BNF shit. Um, yes, they it, it's in their spec, but it's a mess. Um, That's really cool. Everyone's just meeting up. So yes, there's a link now in the stream. Um, I will link that in the YouTube video to Shin's thing on Saturday. Um, bug number 13 said, anyone here already implemented a Lisp? I don't think I have from scratch. Uh, I've compiled Lisp to other things, but not done that. Um, Oh, sorry, Shin. I thought there was a plan for Saturday. Oh, yeah, it's a um, trial. Oh, yeah, it's a Q&A stream on the trial engine. Cool. So, yes, sorry. Not a dry run for the um, ELS talk. That was me making up shit. Okay, if it happens there's no one there, nobody asks anything, I'll... Uh... Okay, so, yes, go there, ask questions. That'll be fun. I will be probably drunk in the comments. <laughs> That's my plan is to... Pour up a glass glass of something and uh, generally just shit post, which would be awesome. Um, uh, Shin's also saying if you can't make the stream but would like some to ask something, uh, then to email him um, and he will bring it up in the stream. So that's cool. Shipmira is saying uh, it would be better to have something like a flat color that's got a pl plastic material applied. Totally agree. We'll probably do something like that. Um, again, like when it comes down to styling, I, I leave that to Johnny because he's actually good at it. I have no eye yet. What would happen if you add another light source? That's actually fine. Um, I mean, it should respect it. If this if this is working, then it should respect it. But I'm not entirely convinced it is. Um, but I'm not sure why. Why? And it might just be that, yeah, like, 
It could be that the light position is quite low. Let's have a look. Where are my lights defined? Oh, there's something called lights. That's handy. Uh, okay, that's the UBO. So what happens if I just pull that? That's a lot of lights. Okay, so... That's a lot of nuts. Okay, so uh, yeah, this one's at 5. And we've already placed our object at like um, Y10. So the light is lower. So it's probably just not getting in there. So can we just push this back? What's the best way to do this? Let's fuck around with this for a bit. So let's go light says UBO. And we can get UBO data is a GPU array. And then we're going to have with GPU array as C array temp move this down stop it um, then we can go let's just uh, do temp and see what it is okay that's the C array oh, of course it is yeah um, then we can do a ref C and get the first element out which is a light set and then we can do a light set something and we can find out what we have there P lights and that's itself is a C array with 30 elements, so up to 30 lights. We're going to take the first one of those, which is ARF0 again, and we can, well, fuck you, buddy. Okay, because it's not ARF, it's ARF C. And we get the P light. And then we can go into that. P light. It's getting really long. And it has a POS. And we return that, and we can see that it is the 0, 05 minus 18, which is over here somewhere. Um, so let's change that. Let's go set f that. I love this shit. If this works, I'm super happy. Um, zero. Let's put it at 15 and keep it at minus 18. And there we go. Okay, cool. So we can see that the, sur the top surface is lighter now when we move that light. Um, also, this is just... Should I... Reasons I really like having <laughs> these silly tools is because we're able to just... In the wrap, we'll talk about a specific element in an array, in an array, in a UBO, on the GPU, and just change it with setf, and it's just like, yep, it's fine. Urgh, love these. Cool. <laughs> oh boy, what's going on? Jason is saying he's implemented a list before, but it was pretty dumb. Um, it does type checking in any way, though. But what kind of uh, things was it doing for the type checking, Jace? It says probably never released the code. That's fine. Makes sense. Um, written in Lisp. Yeah, that makes sense. Or so implementing a Lisp in Lisp seems like cheating. Depends. Depends. Like, it certainly makes it easier. Um, yeah. Yeah, cheating on the parser, te technically, yeah. It was for a research project uh, on the type thingy, so the parser wasn't important. That makes sense. Has anyone used ULISP before? Yeah, MicroLISP. If yes, what's the workflow like? Let's just bring up that link, because that's kind of interesting. Um, still think that lighting's off. Wait, did I actually... No, I did the normal there. Top posture be different? I don't know what I've done wrong there. Where was it? Someone mentioned ULISP. Yeah, there it is. Boop. Yes, that looks super interesting. I'm not like 100% sold on the idea. Like, MicroLisp has a GC, so I mean, it would be cool to get away from that. Um, it, but then again, it's also, it's working now and it's useful now. So that's kind of cool. Um, it would be interesting to get something like BoneLisp. Or carp, because I think I don't think bone lisp. I don't think bone has been worked on for a while, at least. Oh no! Oh no! There we go. Yeah, two thousand eight. Why? Why? Who wanted you to do that? It wasn't me. Okay. So yeah, it's been a while since that's worked on, but again, like we don't know what that chaps or chapess is. Um, life is like right now, so they might just be too busy. It doesn't mean this is dead. But it was kind of interesting. It did not have a GC. Um, another one that's kind of interesting along that line is CARP. 
which is a static lead type uh, lisp without a GC. Um, it'd be fun to see that on some smaller things as well. Again, it's a bit closure in syntax, but again, that is syntax is just really not the biggest deal in a language. It's nice, but as long as I have control of it, I don't care too much. Um, that name's really familiar. Maybe it's just because I've been here a lot. But yeah, kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear about anyone who's using MicroLisp because that looks cool. I've got a few Arduinos and things knocking around that are just, yeah, sitting there. So I could really do with them. Um, Really do with getting them out for a project at some point. Bug number 13. While implementing a Lisp in C is useful, there's no Lisp on the target machine. I mean, it's, there's just so many implementations on so many machines now. But yeah. But it's like, it's which Lisp, which kind of feature set do you want? There's a lot of schemes on different things as well. Um... <laughs> yeah. Um, Clawfear? Sorry if I'm getting your name wrong, mate. Um, Clawfear? Which of your vids would you recommend for Lisp noobs? I would recommend the... Um, if, like, starting from scratch, then there's the Little Bits of Lisp series. That assumes no knowledge. Um, and any time it does use information from another video, it tells you which video. Or at least it mentions that there was another video where you can get that information from. Um... So we could start there. Um, I'm also open to doing more kinds of content. I've got a couple of emails. I'm really sorry if you've emailed me and I haven't answered. <laughs> I, I will get to you. I know there's two emails there about starting out learning Lisp and things like this. Um, I'm sorry that my time has not been that free. I will I will get to you folks. Um, Arasus says, Carp is really cool. Have you used it for anything? I'd be really interested in what that was like. Um... Darius is saying, yep, good stuff, feels natural, but quite crazy. Awesome. Uh, hey, Bugnow13 did an old Lisp implementation in Java. Hey, good for you, ma'am. That's all right, we all write bad code here. Mine's on video, so it's, yeah, no escaping from that. The only blessing is there's not too many viewers. There's, a, there's more of you now these days. It was quite scary. There's a couple of thousand subscribers. What are you doing? Um, seen a game in Carp on the Game Jam. That's dope. That's really cool. Oh, let's hope that they, I, I really love it when there's a nice variety of different lisps in the Lisp Game Jam. Um, as I said, I've only looked at Carp's features. Haven't used it though. And we are in the same boat. Yeah, so if someone's looking for example code, then that came in the game jam. Nice. Oh, smack my knee. <sighs> that, that's pretty tough, actually. We could go look at some of that code, but like jam, game jam code is nightmare code, always. Um, because like you get towards the end and you're just like, fucking work. <laughs> so it's... Um, Do these not say what they're written in? Boo. Hey. I placed somewhere. Where did I place? Sixth. Boom. Out of seven. No. A few more than that. Um, submissions. None of these say up front what they were written in. Uh, I can't submit you to just me looking through all of these to find the carp one. There's also someone who does a few of these who did the, does the game in their own Lisp, which is just so cool. And they have a really nice... I can't remember who it was, but they have a lovely sense of style as well. They seem to know the limitation of their, their, their system. And they have a style that really suits it. And it's just fucking great work every time. It's really cool. Love people that know that stuff yeah so talking about since i'm still here um oh yeah for people who are watching um for the original like <laughs> actual thing we were doing I'm, I'm pretty convinced that i know what's going on with this thing now and the extra stuff is just kind of book work so that's probably as far as i need to take it 
Um, so the rest of the stream is going to be stuff, and we'll we'll work out what that is. So if you want to head off at this point, I don't blame you. Thank you so much for stopping by, but I'm going to stay here for a little bit longer while people are hanging out and um, talk about random stuff. Also about some future projects, which I want to do. And yeah, let's see what's going on over here. Um... Actually, the LD39 code was pretty okay, says Shimera. Nice. Um, this is it. It's from the creator of Carp himself. Oh, cool. It's Dependency Day. <laughs> Cute name. Oh, neat. Lovely. Oh, yeah, it's Eric. Nice. So let's have a look. Oh, it's a post-mortem as well. Oh, this is good. Oh, see, this is just. Yeah, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to come back to this and have a good read because this is just like having nice, honest breakdowns of um, of issues and thoughts and things like this from someone who knows what they're talking about is always just really lovely. Um, let's have a look at some carp. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, at here was about taking a reference. It was related to references anyway, so I'm just going to assume it's reference related with that. I see that. It might be DREF, who knows. But again, there's nothing too weird there. Again, it's all functionally kind of stuff, and again, it's clearly got a good enough type checker that it's. No, oh, not spoke, we've just been in there. Um, not having to have annotations everywhere, which is lovely. Most of this is just calling out to SDL, so it's using, again, like, that's perfectly fine. Oh, we were just in there. Hmm. Let's have a look. So main, finding a load of stuff for input, and art, and object. Let's keep going. Def types, okay. In some bulls. What kind of int? That's interesting. Um, all right. Doing some funky sign math with ints. That's what we always end up with, uh, with ticks. Do that all the time. Looping through things and calling drawer on it, absolutely. Again, pretty simple stuff, but this is all looks very familiar, so it's... Yeah, I could check this out, for sure. That's really interesting. Carpus, there's some, there's some really interesting things out there, for sure. Um... Yeah, so that was dependency day down here i'm not sure if i will be doing the game jam this year we will see again there's a lot of things going on around that time kickstarter and that kind of stuff and, and obviously work takes priority um shin was saying what did you want to talk to me about regarding the glsl spec um off off stream um i'll get back to you about that uh, might have some resources that are helpful uh, for some of the stuff you're looking at. I'm not sure. I'll have to dig through some of the stuff I've got. Um, yeah, Carp has SDL wrappers. So that's... I think they have GLFW as well, which is nice too. It's a great name for a game. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, so future streams. Um, <laughs> too dirty for stream. Yeah, it's just pictures of my balls. That should help you. No. Um, yeah, future stuff. I'm... Making some progress on the um, type checker for a new compiler that I'm working on, and I probably will start bringing that stuff to the stream. Um, so what I'm wanting to do is make a simple data processing language. Um, it's kind of database is It's about processing large amounts of flat data from Lisp. Um, we're having a statically typed um, subset of Lisp for writing what amounts to queries, um, which are like 
no mutation, no recursion um, kind of queries, so we can cross-compile them different places. I'll be talking about that in future as well. Um, and I want to compile this down to SIMD code. And um, yes, that's the plan. Um, I've had a little, like, obviously during the hiatus, I didn't get anything done on it. I've started looking at it again, and then I got kind of, I made some progress with the, um, some of the first optimizing passes. They're super simple. I'm not sure if this is, let me just um, go see what I have on here. Code. Tables in here? Yeah. Let's pull that. Uh, I should ch checkmate as well. This library is. Um, checkmate is the library which provides um, basic functionality for a type checker. Um, and it allows you to implement things on, st on top of that. It is not ready for use yet. It is being developed in um, parallel, like, yeah, in parallel with a project that's actually using it. Um, it owns way too much at the moment that's going to step out, but it's a bi-directional type checker used for static checking. And it's, so it can do all the stuff like, well, it can do a bunch of the kind of stuff that Haskell can do. Um, it doesn't go into type classes and things like that, but it's, it's more than a Hindley Milner inference, for example. Uh, you can implement other things on top of it. It's quite nice. Um, I'm also looking into, I've ordered a couple of books that I'll be looking at. I'm getting one on Idris. And uh, the little typer, which is also excellent. I will get links on those. So uh, the little typer. And um, oh, what's it called? Um, type de uh, type oriented uh, development. Type oriented, something like that. Development in Idris. Yeah, there we go. Type-driven development with Idris. That was what it was called. Another thing's calling itself TDD. Nice. Right. So I'm getting hold of this book. I watched a talk from some of these guys and it looked really interesting. So um, I will be digging into that. I haven't done much dependent type stuff yet, but it is very cool. And uh, like, I'm not doing any Haskell stuff because Haskell's too practical. <laughs> Haskell's grown into that language for actually getting shit done. And what I really want to do is get insight and really wacky type systems. Um, so Idris has a bit more for me there. Just, I mean, I, again, I, I've looked at enough Haskell to be able to read some of it, but... Um, and I, I do need to do more Haskell. There is no doubt about that. There's still a lot of, lot of stuff to learn from a bit for there. But we'll get there. Um, okay. Tables. What have we got? Core. Compile. And package. Tables. Compile. Um, test. Right, so... Um, what I've got at the moment is something that can take this block of code. So we can see just a bunch of like lambdas with ifs and more lambdas here and funcles and literals and things like this. It type checks all of this so you can get, um, so it gets full type information and then it optimizes this graph down to something simpler. And the result is constant 20. So all of this code folds down to just a constant. Um, I've got a whole bunch of work to do to like, get this to a point where it's actually useful. I wanted to start writing some of the kind of like standard library functions so I could do more interesting checking um, and inlining and things like this. Um, it does handle like function inlining and stuff like this. Let's, let me just get the, um, if I, let's have a look. If I do infer on this block of code, um, let's bring up that code here so we can see it. Ugh, actually, yeah. Lisp mode. Right. So it gets pretty gnarly, but you can see a bunch of truly these, and then um, this hash t means it's, an, it's a type object. So it's an object that's des that describes a type. Um, and you can see that we have this fun call here. It's able to work out that this g function there is a um, function from boolean uh, that takes a bool and an i8, which is an 8-bit integer, and returns an 8-bit integer. And then all of this stuff in here is um, type expanded as well. 
and then the compiler stages take this and reduce it down to this because yeah it becomes pretty quick to see how this will this will fold away it's really trivial stuff so obviously x is 20 so this x is 20 um if t um then of course this is just going to become f um this fun call it's like can be stripped because its result isn't used for anything um and there are no side effects here so g is not used so that's gone um f can move down here because it's can get constant folded which means the let goes away um if b um well b is a so this can just be if a and um then we can inline this function um so then we're passing in a becomes t so let's let's just do that actually let's let inline the function um this becomes t oh no. this becomes t and this becomes 20 um then of course this just produces down to this and the result is constant 20. so that's all that pass is doing um but yeah, there's a bunch of bits I'm working on. Uh, I've had to design the type for the... the I, I've been trying to work out the type system for the query language, and that's taken some time. Um, big number 13. Did they call it fun call on purpose with emphasis and fun? Yes, they did call it on purpose, and I don't think for your reason. Um, oh, Metians. Uh, sorry, I missed a problem. We're starting this episode. Test in... Foo Lisp complains when creating objects and split sequence is missing. Please pull um, the latest of Keppel and Vario. Um, I pushed some stuff today for that. And Shimera actually has some actual information. It says it's historical. Yeah, probably even before Mac Lisp. Um, so yes, we've got first little bits of an optimizing compiler the really really simple stuff lots of like constant propagation and function inlining and all this kind of stuff this is going to be an aggressively optimizing ag aggressively inlining compiler um it's not made for general stuff it's basically like shaders for the cpu um so it's a poor man's ispc is the goal um but interactive development just like we've had with Keppel so you'll be able to change these these function these um, queries will get turned into SIMD code and you'll be able to live code that stuff and do all kinds of testing it's going to be a lot of fun and we will be starting to develop some of that on um, on the streams so let's have a look what else is there yes the reason that some of that type um, stuff has taken a while is because the language that I'm looking to make is going to be quite explicit about data layout. So yeah, you have, you can say, okay, this isn't like, you can define structs that are tightly packed in memory. So you can define a struct that's packed into a 32 bit integer and things like this. And that affects how it's stored. Um, but of course, like we're going to be compiling into either SIMD code for, um, on SBCL, but we're going to be compiling back to just regular Lisp code. Um, for, for everything else. Uh, possibly ECL might have the SIMD stuff as well. And so then types get tricky because as soon as you read something out of the FFI block of memory, it's Lisp data and its representation is really not up to you anymore. Um, so I, I was struggling for a while thinking about some of the things and it turned out that Booleans are just a complicated type and I hadn't realized. Because um, a Boolean is like types in, in Lisp is, a, is kind of are just sets of values um, so in this case it's t and nil um, but a boolean like when we're talking about its storage a boolean is one bit of information that all that all it ever needs to be is one bit um, but typically like obviously you can't address a single bit in memory so maybe your bools in your language are stored in a byte um, like in c sharp or something like this um, that's one way of doing it, but it, but it doesn't make it any more or less of a bool than one bit. The the bool is the piece of information. It's the true or, or true or false. Um, this is also means you can have. I mean, it's often you have like thirty two bit booleans, or you have like um, what else have I seen? Yeah, I mean, you can have different size booleans. They're all booleans, 
And so it seems silly to not be able to specify, hey, I just want a Boolean here and I don't care about the storage or I want to be explicit about the storage in certain places. And doing that without special casing in the in the compiler was just interesting. I had to give that up. I am looking to go back and do a statically typed DSL, like statically typed subset of Lisp, which you have that kind of control. But to do that, I'm going to have to do like my own assembly generation and stuff like this. Um, so that's going to be, that's future stuff. Um, but that's not going to be for a long time. The first thing I want to do is this silly data processing hoo-ha stuff. Yeah. Um, Maddie Ann says, uh, sorry, wasn't latest. No problem. That's cool. AK Cram saying, are you writing this compiler with a specific use case in mind? Yes. What is the purpose of it? The purpose came up um, a, a lot of game jams ago um, when I was doing... I wonder if we can find the other ones. Does, does 16 still exist? Is it 16? Fine. It's not called that. It's called something else. Don't care. Um, it was just a shot in the dark. Actually, I hosted it up by Enfiano. It's probably a few of them in here. Do, do, do. There we go. Easy mode. And 2016. <laughs> One submission. Whoops. Submissions. I had... Oh. Don't say it was earlier than that. I can't cope with the idea that it was 2015 or something. Oh, that was autumn 2016. Okay. Um, this jam spring or something. 2016, there we go. Let's have a look. In here, I made a game called Vacuum. Has it really not got a... Um... That is a fucking terrible screenshot. That's amazingly bad. Okay, forget that. Um, what it was, was there was... You were this little rock... And you would fly around, and if you collided with things of roughly the same size as you, they would stick to you. It was kind of like shitty space catamari. Uh, if, you, if anything that was too big hit you, you would break apart. Um, and the idea was to become as big as possible, and you would grow until you're a black hole or a star or something like this. Um, but what was really interesting was I was really trying to make this easy to to work with. So I'm like, oh, okay, we're gonna, I'm going to do things all clean. I'm going to describe these the different planetoids just as data so it's just gonna be lists right and so at the beginning of each level you've got this list that describes what ratio of different planetoids should be in in the um, in the in that level and so it's just plain old data and then the level starts and it instantiates all those things and great and then you go and you want to change one of the values like you want to change the speed of the asteroid or something like this and I realized I had reinvented the compile loop because what happened was I would go and change that data, but it was just data. It didn't know anything about anything. So I would have to restart the level every time I made a change, which sucked because I wanted to maintain that state. And it was really educational on this thing of Lisp. Again, just having a live coding language, having a language where you can compile stuff live isn't enough for it to be like a useful tool. Um... And so that's why I'm kind of like, when languages come up with like, we've got, you know, we've got a REPL now, everything's great. Um, it's nowhere near enough. So I wanted to have something where I could do, um, like make it really easy to do queries over data and update things and things like this. That's one part of it. Um, the second part was just doing lots of stuff. Um, there's a lot of, you'll have seen online the kind of data oriented design type things. Um, the importance of data locality and how you can lay things out to get a lot more performance. The thing that in games, having one of something is the, like, is a really odd case. It's the rare case. The common case is you have lots of something, right? And when you have lots of something, uh, then you have loads of opportunities for optimization there. So that's interesting. And it's like, there's no reason... All of those things, tech talks tend to be around languages where like C++ or C or J or Rust or things like this. But there's no reason that any language can do it because the computer doesn't fucking care. The computer doesn't care what language you use. It only cares about assembly. It cares about data. It cares about the shape of the instructions, which is data, and the shape of the stuff that you're processing, which is also data. So if you have a language that allows you to shape data correctly, like precisely, 
um, then you should be able to get these benefits as well. That is the theory. And I want to see if I can do that in Lisp in a way that's fun, live code -y and stuff. It's not super practical. And again, like I highly recommend ISPC, um, the SPIMD compiler. Um, really, really cool. Uh, that's a really boring page for a really cool thing. Um, hopefully they have a, like a picture from some of the stuff they were ray tracing. They don't. Why not? That's so cool. Um, this is a compiler that will um, take a C-like language down to SIMD code. And it's, yeah, it's really dope. And it's worth playing with. But again, I want to make my own because it's fun. Um, and so, yeah, that was one part. That was another part. The other thing I was just realizing was, was myself was when I was doing these games, um, keeping, keeping the model in your head is quite tricky a lot of the time. And there was a lot of cases where I had just what amounted to static data or flat data. And there was no reason that it couldn't ha be just given a name, like a function. When we write a function like test pass two, you can kind of imagine it being somewhere. Like there isn't, there aren't many instances of this function. There's this guy. Um, and everyone that calls this guy comes to this guy. Now I know not exactly true, but what matters is the kind of model that you can use while you're coding. There was no reason that you couldn't have a table of data that just has a single name, is a singleton, right? There's nothing wrong with that pattern. Again, like in databases, you have, you make a table. You're not defining a class of a table and you have many instances of that table with different data. You say, okay, this is the customer's table, right? Um, and there's just lots of really interesting things you can start doing with that. Like, okay, so we have a, you have a table, which is data for state machines, right? And then we tell on the column definition, um, I don't really have an example here. We have the definition for the table and all its columns. And we say, and we have an enum um, on the state. So maybe the, the little state machines can be in one of five states. And we tell this column, hey, cluster on this column. This is something that databases do, but they do it automatically behind the scenes, right? You cluster on this column. What it'll do is it will pack together all of, the, um, all of those rows with the same enum value together in memory. What's nice about this is now those are tightly packed together. When you process them, it helps your um, branch prediction. Because if you have an if and it's on that value, then it's going to be the same the majority of the time. So you're really helping your processor move faster. What's actually interesting is if they're packed together, there's no reason we couldn't have the compiler hard code the, like compile five different versions of your query that you're doing um, and hard code that value in each of them or at least set them to be uniform right across the whole run. Then what we're doing is because I want to do multi-threaded execution as well, so um, we can dispatch each of those in parallel on the different chunks. So now you're getting um, instruction level parallelism from the SIMD. You're getting um, core level parallelism from splitting this out. And we're helping because we've just inlined this stuff and we can compile it like that. And Lisp really helps us compile things how we need it. Um, we can, yeah, we can use all that kind of optimizations that come from folding data away. So the code's going to run faster as well. So there's, there's a lot of things we can play with here that just are really, really fun. Um, and uh, yeah, I really want to do it. So it'll be, it'll, be, it'll be nice. It's just it's a bunch of ideas that have been kind of nebulous in my head for a long time. Um, there's no point pulling any of these projects. There's really nothing to see yet. But when there is, I'm happy to show you. And I want to start screwing around with some of these compiler passes and things on the stream. Um, these ones are very simple. What we have so far is it's like really simple constant folding, um, inlining calls that are not behind ifs. Um, any bindings that aren't being used get stripped. Um, and then we just, yeah, we run, run those a few times and it, and it results in something decent. Um, and yeah, we're going to get into a whole bunch of stuff with that, which should be a lot of fun. That's where I want to go. That's definitely the project I want to do most at the moment. And then the idea, of course, is to... Well, not of course, I haven't told you. The idea is to go back to... Um, do you remember that little 2D engine we were doing in um, in our streams a while ago? What was called Daft, I think. If we go back and have a look at this, because the... I can't remember if it's... So what we had, our data model here... Let's have a look. See if I can find it. How... I can't remember any of this. Uh, main loop. Uh, 
update actor kinds. So let's go grab find that. I should load this project, but okay, here we go. So what we would do is we have we had collections of actor objects of different kinds. We would iterate across them and we would update them. And they, the actors were very simple. Um, yeah, were really simple little bits of code. Let's have a look. We would define these little things, these little programs, which just run once a frame. Now, there's no reason each of these couldn't define their own table or an instance within a table. Um, basically, this could all be flat data, and we could compile this all down to something else and hopefully run it really fast. We would avoid uh, GC. We would avoid per frame a lot of per frame allocation stuff. Um, we could really get a lot more out of this. And this, this model would fit really well with that kind of data structure. That's so something I want to try. There's also a lot of interesting possibilities with if we have multiple tables. Obviously, we're going to have tables, and we're going to be able to join, to do joins, um, to query across two tables at once. Indices, like, so there'll be, I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to do this yet. I've got a lot of notes, but I can't recall them all right now because it's been taking the place over a year or so. Um, the join doesn't necessarily have to be in the query. You can specify these things ahead of time. Um, we'll work that out. But when you loosen up the requirements for um, some of the order things, there's some really nice optimizations you can do. Because like in here, all of the actors only care about the current state of other actors, right? They don't, you don't, when we're updating, you only get to see um, the previous state of the actor, not the new state of the actor. And this is really good. So everything basically up, feels like it's updating in lockstep. Um, with that kind of um, freedom, we can do a lot of uh, interesting stuff, especially with those queries. So that's the idea. Um, so we'll make that, and then at some point in the future, we'll come back and remake this and see what kind of like speed ups we can get. It's very much in the same family of ideas as Unity's Burst compiler and, and the stuff they're doing there and ISPC, but different from both of them, it's a lot more restricted. And I have some fun ideas of things that we can do fairly trivially that they might not be able to do because we have this nice um, Lisp to GLSL compilers and stuff. Um, Arasus is saying it sounds like igar.io. That is very interesting. Let's have a look at what that is. Oh. Go on, you can have tag services for a minute. Uh, fucking, oh, Jesus Christ. No, I don't think, I, oh my goodness. No, you know what, never mind. <laughs> I'm sure that's a lovely game, but it doesn't play very well with what I'm doing on blocking things. <laughs> Sounds really cool, though. I'd like to see um, how these ideas work out. Me too. That's kind of the fun. I mean, just like, it's not... Yeah. It's not something to take seriously. Like, this isn't like, oh my god, I've come up with a new way of doing this. These are all old ideas done in a very limited way. A really dumb compiler. Like, the compiler's going to be super stupid because basically everything that's hard, I'm ignoring. Right? I just say, oh, you can't do that in this language. You can't have this. You can't have that. And it makes the <laughs> makes the passes really easy to write, obviously. You take out all the hard stuff, then we only have the easy stuff left. Um... Arazu is saying, oh wow, when did that website turn to shit? I remember it differently from some years ago. It might be all the stuff I'm blocking, but it might just be shit. Um, Jace is saying, I ought to look into Idris. Um, I, oh, okay, I'm, I'm actually slightly out of order. Jace is saying, Idris and the little typer are both awesome. Oh, and you might want to look into certified programming with independent types. Oh, cool. Okay, I'll check that out. Haskell isn't pure enough. It's just, again, what I really respected immediately from looking at Idris was the same kind of thing that you see in um, Common Lisp in a way, which is the, you're allowed to do things at compile time. This isn't magical, right? You can just, here's a function that returns a type. Okay, you can use that as a type. That makes a lot of sense. It, 
I, I'm not super sure how strong the contracts are to make sure, like, how clear it feels when you're running something at compile time or not. Um, I don't like the idea of things, like, transparently migrating into being runtime checks, so I'm not sure about that, but um, it's something I'd definitely like to learn more about because I'm just a noob at all this stuff. And it really, for me, like to be able to understand, I need a kind of more mechanical understanding. I find the type theory stuff super confusing. I, I never really get it, but I have a wonderful friend who walked me through a load of the stuff. And you get to a point where you go, there's actually a really simple mechanism behind a lot of these things. And as soon as I see it like a mechanism, it's really easy to understand. Um, but I don't need the... the I probably am missing out on the deeper truths, but they're also not something I'm as interested in. I know they'll be there for me when I need them. Um, Yeah, Jason was saying, yeah, I can imagine that's a pain, especially when you combine it with more advanced type trickery. I ought to look into Idris's answer to that kind of problem, see if they properly formalize the semantics of types with data layout. I haven't seen it. Um, a language you probably will be interested in is actually made by the person that I go to with all my type problems. Um, it's called Sixton. Um, it's not written like that, so I have no idea what that is. Sixton is a language. Let's go to GitHub. Made by this chap. Um, yeah, ty types are polymorphic over their size. Um, so it allows you to actually talk about um, things and their, their size in memory. Um, it's really cool. Um, I highly recommend checking it out if you're really into that kind of stuff. Um, he's always open for more people contributing as well, so it might be something you're interested in. Um, but yes. Really cool chap, lots of knowledge. Um, yeah, it's a good one to just give a drink and ask a question. It's just like sit back and learn. Really cool. Um, Metian saying Delta UV1 and 2 should be Vec2 in Calc in Foo Lisp. Metian, you're a star. You always are. This is really good. Delta UV1, Delta UV2. Something I'm missing here. Uh, I don't know how this is used. Let's have a look. Still got time, so if you folks have questions about anything, I'm more than happy to dig into it. This is all the same file, so I don't need to go anywhere. Um, that is interesting. So, cylinder GPU arrays, yeah. Let's just go in here and find out what's going on Jesus what's all this um <sighs> Yeah, you would have thought UVs from here were vec2 
which would mean what the fuck? Let's have a look. What's going on here? You get the verts. We're calling calc, passing that in. We get this and we call text. Yeah, and it's gotta be one of these types and that's definitely a VEC2. Oof, that's bad. <laughs> How interesting. Median saying it should be V2, not V3. Yeah, V2 minus. 100% agree. I, I just wanted to... Thanks so much for pointing everything out. I needed to follow that logic. I just wanted to know why. It seems rather dumb, obviously, but... That's what you get if you don't have type checking. All right, yeah, we should um, stage everything as well. Um, let's do this. Let's say... Yay, effect worked. That's a nice change. Um, and this B2 for UVs, B3. Terrible write up, but that doesn't matter. It's just for the streams. Cool. Thank you very much. Jace97 saying, ooh, that's dependently typed. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, um, I, I'm. Constantly picking his brain on that kind of stuff. Yeah, dependently typed over the size of the data. It's really interesting, and I think it's very much worth an investigation. Um, it's still GC'd, so that has its own things. Oh, yeah, the other thing, of course, was uh, about the previous project that I want to do is getting more things out of the GC means the GC pauses are going to be smaller because there's less load, like less data. in the, Like, when you know the life cycle, like, categorically, then there's no point spending cycles having something work out when it's free i know when it's free i can tell you when it's free and i can tell you to never look at it so by sticking things in the ffi we keep it away from the gc which i mean just means everything's better we're not paying costs we don't need and the costs we we're paying are like a dumb faster and it's just i like it it has potential um yeah so I think that's it. Um, any more for any more? Or we'll probably just wrap up. Because that actually went on for quite a while. I'm glad we had some content. That's been good. It's nice to actually do something simple for a change as well. Um, I'll show you once we get the more advanced version of the technique working. I'll uh, be sure to show you what's going on. Oh, that was the other thing we could have done. Fuck, I didn't even think about it. And we're kind of low on time now was the stuff we did last week we didn't i mean we kind of proved that it worked but we didn't prove it in a very satisfying way you know um malicum free are more expensive gc for the same workloads yes in you can definitely construct cases where like common cases where they are um but none of those cases are ones where in in the library that i'm talking about um, allocating large chunks ahead of time and then doing um, sub allocations out of that. So custom, custom malloc, which is just b bullshit for like I've allocated a block earlier. Um, there's a whole bunch of tricks just based around the idea that we know something about the life cycle of the data. Um, yeah. For certain definitions of malloc free and GC, yes. One of the things as well is that, like, obviously, when you allocate a bunch of things in Common Lisp or any, or any, most decently, um, like, sensible GC languages, um, they're allocating, like, maybe a 4K chunk or something like this, a 16K chunk, and then sub-allocating out of that anyway. So all your initial allocations are packed together while they're memory. Problem is, is, if you start doing many updates on within that data structure, um, then you slowly, you don't, you don't get guarantees that the things are still within that data range. Um, it's fine for like a raise or something like this. You can alloc allocate a fray of single floats and you're modifying in there. It's going to be fine. But um, Lisp, a list of objects, for example, will slowly become more diffuse across memory. 
and so it means that your game runs for the like in that 10 minute window that you're testing it or two minute window or whatever we end up using with this kind of stuff and it gets progressively worse over time in a way that's really hard to model and i don't like that so i'd rather um again for things that we know explicitly let's state them explicitly and then the things that we don't like we get all that any time we free up is something that we have to give to the stuff where we know less. Um, that's what you have a compacting GC for? Uh, not necessarily. It doesn't doesn't know about the relationships of data, so it doesn't know what it should be packing together. It's no good if it like if I have a bunch of foos that are meant to be gather, uh, together, um, and then we delete ten of them and it starts packing in bars in between there. That's that's not great. Like it doesn't know that this area is really about just foos. Whereas if I make a slab allocator, it's like for that single type, um, which could be a lot better. Um, yeah, the idea is with this as well, we have some kind of knowledge of what a frame amounts to. Um, I'm not sure how deeply I'll tie that into this or it'll be a system I build on top of it. Um, yeah. Following, yeah, sure it knows the relations following the point is what it does, but it's not I didn't mean relationships in that way. I more, more meant the higher level relationships that we impose. Like when we're talking about things in the game. Like it doesn't know what order we're going to be executing things. So it doesn't know what order we're going to be touching memory in. And there might be patterns that we can't express to it um, from outside, right? Definitely seems to be what I've seen so far, but always open to read more. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so that's really it's about it's about keeping things together where we want it to be. I mean, that's a small thing. It's just it's just interesting, you know. It's a, it's a fun design challenge to play with. It's like, hey, what if we were going to talk about this explicitly, or what if we we're going to do that? It could be a fun little tool, at least for me, and at least for these streams. But yeah, so more of that um, as I design that language. Um, that should come along a little faster now. Um, Oh yeah, should, oh, more stuff. I love more stuff. Guys, keep it coming. I love this. We're almost at the end of the stream. We did two hours. And you can certainly write a GC that allows you to lay out constraints. I mean, yeah, in a way we kind of are. Like if, if you... This system, <laughs> whatever it ends up being, I mean, it is still managing the memory for us. The user doesn't have to care. As far as they're concerned, it's all GC'd, but it's just a much more uh, coarse GC rather than granular. Um, and it's the library that's deciding when things are freed. So it's really, I mean, there's still costs there. So it's I've to move something from one GC to another that knows, that has different assumptions about or and different information. So yeah, shit, shit saying right. So yeah, we're, we're we're talking to the same point from different directions. It sounds like that's cool. I was just saying, I think Graal VM does this on the JVM. Yeah, they like there's a lot of things obviously in um especially in the java world um for their uh huge heaps like multi-terabyte heap stuff i started reading some of those talks like watching some of those talks but they because all of the optimizations are about this assumption of like fucking massive heaps um and it's a very different world and the kind of trade-offs they're doing are very different um the talk by naughty dog about their scheduler that's a fucking great talk i love that so much i watched that oh so many times it's really good um yes their scheduler stuff about what a frame a frame being a data structure rather than being a period of time per se is really good um i love the kind of um scratch allocators so you just um pointer bumping kind of allocator that you then free at the end of every frame it's a, like all of these techniques are super well known in the games industry and are used all the time arsus do you have a link fuck yeah we have a link we can go find that um no see dog uh it was it was to do with um fibers paralyzing the naughty dog engine using fibers but it would be even better if it was on youtube so we wouldn't have to use their fucking site Oh no, that's archive dog. No, but that works too. Um, I'll link this one, and you can go find the variants. Oh, Shin bit me to it. 
Fuck you! Didn't look until it was too late. Too slow, baggers. Damn right, I am. That's why these two hours... <laughs> we never fin normally don't finish things on time. Um, but today we did. And it is 10 o'clock now. So that is as good a segue into finishing as we're ever going to get. So, um... Bug number 13, what a coincidence. I'm currently entering some fiber code. Uh, it's currently implementing some fiber code. That's really cool. Please tell me about that next time. I'd love to hear it. Um, dope. Okay. We're off, folks. Thank you so much for hanging out, and we'll do something else next time. Peace.